Hi everybody, welcome to this new series of lectures that I'm preparing right now. Uh, this series of lectures is really a summary of research that my research group here at Brigham Young University has been focused on and, and working diligently to complete over the last, I would say, ooh, seven or eight years even. Um, and it all relates to the topic of performance-based earthquake engineering, and, and specifically the application of performance-based engineering to liquefaction hazard analysis. Now, um, I'm preparing these lectures specifically because the sponsors of our research uh, requested that I provide uh, a workshop or training on these methods for the engineers who ultimately uh, are going to work for the departments of transportation uh, or, or are going to who do work for the Department of Transportation and want to um, understand what their consultants are using in the field. And so this series of trainings was originally intended to be held in person and then COVID hit and um, it flipped the world upside down. And so um, rather than deal with all the travel and all of the restrictions and regulations, uh, they simply asked that I prepare a series of trainings and host them online for them to use. But I figured, well, if I'm going to do that, then I'm going to make this available to the entire world. And um, I do have uh, a few thousand uh, followers on YouTube who follow the lectures and material that I put up there and, and I'd like all of you to benefit from this material as well. And so um, really the, the purpose of this particular uh, lecture here or, or this introduction is just to introduce the topic and let you know what we're talking about. Um, now before I get in to the details of the the technicalities, it's important that I just clarify where this is all coming from. And uh, I have several acknowledgments here that I need to give. The, the research that I'll be describing in this and in the next few lectures in this series uh, was all funded primarily by two um, sources. One of those sources being a conglomerate source. Uh, so the first was an FHWA transportation pooled fund study um, where several states uh, committed and, and contributed funds to support this research. Those were the states of Utah, Alaska, Montana, Idaho, South Carolina, Connecticut, and Oregon. So thank you very much to those states for your um, very generous sponsorship. And, and really it was your sponsorship that made all of this possible. The second was a grant that I applied for and received uh, from the U.S. Geological Survey. Uh, you can see the grant number shown here. There was also a report prepared for that that's available online. All anybody needs to do is Google this uh, report number and it should take you right to that final report. I want to acknowledge as well several of my professional collaborators who along the way or a support, or uh, helped me work through some difficult questions, um, and, and also presented some interesting and difficult questions themselves that, that ultimately improved this work. And so these were uh, Dr. Stephen Kramer, Roy Mayfield, Leslie Yao, Kyle Rollins, and Brett Lingwall. And finally, and uh, definitely, in, in my opinion, deserving the most praise and thanks are the students of mine who made this possible. And I've listed them all here in, in really no particular order. Um, I've got uh, Dr. Kristen Ulmer. She finished her PhD uh, after she worked with me. Uh, she went to Virginia Tech with Russell Green. And now she works for the Southwest Research Institute at the time of this recording. Levi Ekstrom, who currently works for Robba Kistner in Texas. Alexander Wright, who currently works for Kleinfelder in Sacramento and is part of their seismic practice group. Brian Peterson, who's here in Utah working for Gerhard Cole. He's a project manager now. Braden Error, who is also in Utah working for AECOM. Lucy Astorga Hoke, she got married and so her last name is Hoke now. 
Uh, she is in Tacoma working for Geoengineers. Michaela Hatch uh, also works for Geoengineers in Redmond, Washington. And, and Alex Arndt, he works for Nino and More in Las Vegas, Nevada. Tyler Kutu is uh, employed by Kiwit in their Omaha design office. Jingwen He, uh, Liang, she's also married now. Uh, she works, uh, she's actually a PhD student studying with Ellen Rathje at University of Texas, and she is about in her third year or so right now of her PhD studies. And last but not least, Jenny Blonquist, uh, who works for Kleinfelder in Salt Lake City, Utah, but is uh, recently accepted a PhD uh, opportunity with uh, Dr. Brady Cox at Utah State University. So I'm proud of these students. I mean, they're literally all over the country now taking this knowledge out to uh, professionals all around this country, and they're doing great things. And so, um, boy, my chest swells with pride when I think of the, these great students in my past. So um, what am I talking about here? Uh, and you're sitting here going, okay, this is great, but what does this have to do with my practice and how is this going to benefit me? Let's go to the whiteboard here and erase whatever I have on here. Okay, so let's say that you are working on a site. Now, I don't know why the sites that I always draw happen to be like a house doesn't need to be a house. It could be a commercial building. It could be a hospital. It could be a levee. It could be a dam. It could be whatever. But whatever your site is, it's represented by this little house here. Uh, I'll even add a little chimney. How's that? Now, feeling nice and home. Very comfortable. All right. Now, let's say that this site is located in an area that's affected by multiple seismic sources. So you have a fault over here, you have a, a fault down here, you have, let's say, a zone that we don't have defined faults, but we know their seismic activity, so we call this an area source, where we say, well, an earthquake can occur in any one of these grid points, but we just don't know which one. And let's say then that you have another fault that runs up here. So we have um, numerous faults surrounding our site. And let's say that beneath our site we have um, a groundwater table and beneath that groundwater table we have a layer of, of potentially loose sand. And this is the kind of stuff that if an earthquake were to occur and hit that loose sand, that layer is going to potentially liquefy. And if that layer liquefies in an earthquake, there's going to be some various effects that could occur and affect our structure. A few of these effects could be, uh, for instance, um, settlement could occur beneath our site. We could have um, the presence of sand boils and ejecta on the ground surface. We could potentially, I mean, if this site, for instance, was located near the edge of a slope or near uh, the edge of water, like a river or an ocean, um, we could potentially have um, lateral movements. And we could also have bearing capacity problems if the liquefied soil was shallow enough. And there's other potential um, concerns that, that could affect our site, but for the time being, um, this list just gives you an idea so you understand that, that liquefaction is something that we engineers, we geotechnical engineers, uh, are very, very wor worried about. Now. We have methods, by the way, to predict um, the occurrence of all of these effects and to predict the occurrence of liquefaction itself. Um, but these methods are scenario-based, which means that I need a scenario earthquake. So if you give me a scenario earthquake, 
uh, give me, for instance, a ground motion from a scenario earthquake, or, or not even that, just give me the, the magnitude of the earthquake and how far from my site it's located. With that scenario information, I can estimate ground motions, and then I can use the methods that have existed for the last 50 years in various forms to predict the onset or the potential for liquefaction and the potential for undesirable effects if that soil liquefies. So why do we need um, something different if, if these methods have been around for a long time? Well, specifically because of the scenario that I've painted here. So what if, for instance, this is a big earthquake? This fault right here, let's say, produces a magnitude 7.6 earthquake. That's what we suspect is, is capable from that fault up there. But this fault that's located really close to our site down here, it produces a, a much smaller earthquake, let's say like a magnitude 6.0. But it's closer to our site. And this fault over here, that's a little further away, we could say maybe that produces a magnitude of 7.0. And down here, we suspect maybe a magnitude 6.5 anywhere within our aerial sources. Now, don't, don't dwell on how do you know the size of the magnitude. That, that topic is discussed in a different lecture. Um, you can look it up in my 545 class here on... Um, my, my collection of videos on this YouTube channel. But just bear with me and just say, yeah, okay, those are the, the anticipated maximum magnitude earthquakes from these various sources. So we could look at this and we can say, all right, uh, if I've got methods that analyze the scenario of liquefaction, how do I know which scenario to analyze? Do I analyze the big one that's located pretty far away? Do I analyze the small one that's located really close? Do I analyze the medium-sized one that's, that's located um, far away as well? Or, or even the smaller one that's over here? How do I know which one I should analyze? Well, um, I know what you're thinking out there. And you're going, analyze all of them. Why not? And then what you could do is you could pick the worst one and say that's the one that we'll assume, we'll run with, and we'll base our design on that. And, and that type of approach, what we'll talk about in these lectures, it's called a deterministic approach. It's been around uh, since liquefaction methods have been around. And because liquefaction methods were developed specifically to uh, cater to this type of deterministic approach. Now, um, that's all fine and dandy, but if you, for instance, are constantly assuming that the worst or the most significant event or the one that causes the most damage at your site is the one that you're always going to design for, Let's say, uh, let's go ahead and just use some examples here. Let's say that uh, designing for this magnitude 6.0, let's say that that, uh, because of how close it is to the site, we're estimating that that one could produce um, 20 inches of settlement. And let's say that this magnitude 7.6 even though it's a larger magnitude, let's say that we predict um, smaller settlement because the ground motions at our site will be much smaller. So let's say for this instance that that produces a settlement of 12 inches. Okay, so here's a tangible example. So you would say, well, run with the most conservative, the 20 inch, and that's what we'll design for. Yay, done. But it doesn't stop there. What if what our structure could allow was um, 15 inches? I'm just making up numbers, but it, it, it gives a demonstration. What if our structure, our site, could tolerate 15 inches of settlement? And in that case, this site right here 
it doesn't meet it. This event, it does. So if we're taking this conservative deterministic approach, we would say, ah, oh, we failed. Uh-oh, okay, we've got to engineer the site. We have to do something to fix the problem. And that, my friends, always leads to the big issue. It's an issue of money. It's an issue of cost. So if I'm constantly always selecting the most conservative approach in all of my designs, it's going to cost buku bucks. And if everything costs buku bucks, lots of money, I'm going to have very unhappy clients and customers and public. So, and you know, to, let's let's not be um, vague here. Let's go ahead and just assign some numbers. So, let's say, in order to remediate that loose sand beneath my site, it's going to cost 50 million buckaroos. Whereas if this site is the site, or I'm sorry, if this event is the event I'm designing for, it's going to cost nothing. Well, now it got really interesting, didn't it? You can see how the client would be doing everything in his or her power to, to go for that event and say, hey, justify this event being your design event. And, but we can't just willy-nilly pick and choose which events we want to have. Uh, and this gets even messier if we start to consider that each of these events has an associated likelihood uh, uh, with it. So, um, and when we bring into account the likelihood for those events, this problem gets even messier. So, if you put yourselves now in the shoes of these engineers and are trying to understand why this is a big deal and why this is a big issue, you can see the, the pressure and the weight that they're carrying on their shoulders in making these types of decisions. And so the goal of a performance-based approach is to remove all of this subjectivity. And instead, we're going to consider every single one of these events we're not going to look at just one of them we're going to look at all of them and we're going to weight them according to their likelihoods and we're going to develop a weighted average solution it's it's not a weighted average but that's that when i use that phrase people seem to under nod their head in agreement and say i understand it, it, if essentially what we're doing is we are considering contributions from all of these events in looking at the probabilistic or the predicted liquefaction. And now we're basing liquefaction hazard in terms of likelihoods or risk. And that's a good thing because this then allows the owner to take upon himself or herself the onus of the, the liability and say, okay, well, I'm comfortable with this amount of likelihood or this amount of risk. So go ahead and design to that level. So it removes that, that pressure, that weight from the engineer. And, um, the beautiful thing about this approach is that it's consistent everywhere it's applied, whether it's in low seismicity areas like, you know, the western Texas or high seismicity areas like northern or southern California. Regardless, it's the same approach, the same um, framework, and therefore you end up with consistent likelihoods and consistent risk. And that's where we're really heading with performance-based liquefaction hazard analysis. And that's what we're going to discover in um, this series of lectures. So uh, to walk you through this series of lectures, we're going to cover a few things. Uh, so here's just an introduction. We're going to talk about all of the uncertainties. Why do we need a performance base? Could you try again? Oh, 
I have no idea why uh, my Siri just went off. Crazy. We're going to talk about all of the uncertainties in the problem. <laughs> so here's your test. Um, if you're sitting there with an Apple product, say the word uncertainties and see if Siri goes off. I had no idea that that word would trigger Siri. Awesome. What we want to do is we want to look at all of the unknowns associated with liquefaction. We're going to spend some time. We're going to look at the unknowns associated with the ground motions. We're going to look at um, the uh, how we predict ground motions and the uncertainties associated with that. We're going to look at the phenomenon of liquefaction and how we predict it. And those uncertainties, which are a lot. And then um, we're going to look at the um, effects of liquefaction and the uncertainties associated with predicting those. And then finally, we're going to move into performance-based design and give you a crash course in performance-based engineering. And that's when we're going to finally move into um, the simplified performance-based design. And that's the work that was developed by um, these student researchers in, in this funded research project. Uh, and so there's a lot of ground to cover in terms of background so that you understand what's going on. And that's the purpose of this recorded series of um, lectures. So um, no need to dawdle. Let's just jump right into it. Thank you for your attention and this introduction. And um, I'm going to jump right in and, and record my next lecture. And so uh, I feel free to move in as we learn a little bit about ground motion parameters. Thank you, everybody.